Hi, my name is Jeff. This is Tropical Plants at 53 degrees north. Now, today, this video is all about things that I wish I'd known a year ago when I first started growing orchids. Now, of course, I actually started growing orchids about two years ago, but it's only really the last 12 months that I've been really serious about it since I bought this, this greenhouse. So this is the first time really that I've been able to provide the, the proper conditions. So what I'm hoping to do today is I'm going to go through 10 separate things which will hopefully help you if you are growing orchids, maybe probably more suited to people who are growing orchids in a, an unsuitable climate. So let me first tell you, if you're not one of my regular subscribers, let me tell you first of all about the conditions that I've got here. If you are growing orchids in a tropical environment, then the chances are pretty high that a lot of these will not apply to you. These are very specific to growing orchids in a, a non-suitable climate. So I live in the UK, the north of the UK, a very temperate zone. And what we have here, we have seven hour days in winter, which of course is way too short for orchids. And we have extra long days in summer, which is probably too long for orchids. We get dark, dull days, lots and lots of dark, dull days. High humidity, which is fine, but we also do have some periods of low humidity. We have very cold temperatures, we have frost, we have snow during the winter months. So we pretty much have everything that you wouldn't want if you're trying to grow some orchids and of course this is a greenhouse it's not a grow room or a conservatory which to a large extent uh, they kind of insulate against the extremes of those elements whereas in a greenhouse it's amplified to a great extent so i'm hoping that this will help you if you're a beginner and help you to prevent you making those same mistakes that i've made and if you're not, if you're a, an experienced grower, then perhaps it will serve as a reminder. So let's get started. And we're in. So number one of things I wish I'd known. So if you don't know already, I have a warm side and a cold side and I've taken the partition out. You can see here where that will go. Um, just so I can do this video really so over on the cooler side which you're looking towards I had a number of orchids and I'm just going to move over here to the warmer side because what you can see here are damaged orchids mostly from letting them drop below the kind of preferred temperatures now the the leaves on here that were the worst damage have been removed so these this spotting that you can see on here is what's left the ones that weren't that bad so the, there was there were worse on there and same over here so we've got uh, this one is a uh, brassier and that one is an um, aburagira and you can see these black leaves on here now this one is got a bloom that one completely lost all its all its roots uh, that one didn't lose all its roots, but it lost a lot of its leaves. And there, there are several that that happened to. So what we're talking about here, of course, is the temperature for intermediate orchids dropping below 12 degrees Celsius. I didn't really realize how important that was. Now, if you're new to growing orchids and you maybe haven't yet figured out that there are uh, like a general three groupings of orchids the cool growers there are intermediate growers and there are warm growers now this is very very general because of course uh, many orchids straddle some of those some of those barriers as it were and also some orchids are a lot more forgiving than others some of them might be labeled intermediate but might be okay to go into the warm conditions uh, might be okay to drop into the cool conditions and so on uh, but mine the ones that I had that showed the damage, uh, that was literally, literally a week where I let them go down to seven degrees Celsius. Why did I let them go down so much? Well, because I had them at 12, everything was looking absolutely fine. This was probably about January, beginning of February time. Everything was doing really well. And I was looking at the costs and thought, well, you know what, everything's fine. I'm sure if I drop this by another few degrees, it won't make any difference. Well, it did. And it, the, it showed very, very quickly. So that's one thing I wish I'd known, how sensitive some are 
to dropping in temperatures and i would say certainly out of the orchids i've got anyway the danger is more on the cooler side of the spectrum than the warmer side of the spectrum i've found that more orchids are more forgiving at the higher end than they are at the lower end so that's number one of things that i wish i'd known a year ago and incidentally while we're talking about dropping the temperature because of costs coming up for you one of the things that i'm going to be showing you is the actual monthly cost and what number two of things that i wish i'd known a year ago about growing orchids and here you've got a tale of two uh, waterings as it were because it's all about over watering that is a real big problem for me and I'm, I'm almost wanting to go to like a, an overwatering anonymous group if there is one because even though I'm aware of it I still do it and I'm aware that I still do it so on the left here you've got a Miltoniopsis which clearly hasn't been overwatered and seems to be doing okay a little bit of concertina but you know what I don't think I've seen one Miltoniopsis without concertina ring certainly none in a similar climate to me However, the one on the right, this, the one that I lovingly refer to as the worst looking Miltoniopsis in the world, although you can see it is about to bloom, uh, a word on that in a second, but this one was completely overwatered to death and it's very common on this plant because this one is uh, very, very sensitive to either too much or too little water. It just likes it to be right and i did the probably common mistake for anybody in a climate like mine uh, who's definitely used to more temperate kind of plants where you just can't seem to overwater them they just they just are happy to get whatever water you give them that's probably because they're used to living outside in this country and it very rarely stops raining so the problem was i don't think i had it in a clear pot and that's that's probably another one of my issues if it's not in a clear pot you can't see if it's still wet and even then a year ago i wasn't aware that it mattered if it was wet if it looked like it needed some water i would give it some so i'm happy to say even though it still looks dreadful it it is showing some signs now of recovery and would you believe i have actually chopped the blooms off this several times and all it wants to do is keep blooming so there's another one coming there what I'll do, I'll probably let it bloom for a day or two and then I'll chop them off and give it more chance to grow some roots. So over watering is definitely a problem and I've managed to come up with several solutions to that and one of them is to make sure that it's in a transparent pot and another one is to make sure they dry out, leave them to dry out. Now Miltoniopsis is different in that case because they don't want to be totally dry but we're not going into details on Miltoniopsis care. I'm just mentioning overwatering is something that you've got to be careful about. I'll show you another one over here, the Epidendrum. This one is Comet Valley and it's looking really good at the moment. We've got all of the bloom spikes almost all out. Now this one is another one that had no roots whatsoever because I overwatered it. And I'm very wise to that now. But definitely on a, an epidendrum anyway and I know when that needs watering and when it doesn't and letting it dry out is probably the biggest kindness you can do with orchids in a country like this because they they much prefer to dry out than they do to be sitting in water uh, and have it all around the roots so that's the number two is over watering and number three of things that I wish that I'd known a year ago is also along the lines of the overwatering thing, and that is to make sure that you have drainage. You know, I have these gravel trays, and underneath the pots, I didn't used to put stones underneath, gravel underneath. Now I'm very careful of that because orchid roots, again, are very sensitive to being moist. Now, in the wild, you might say, well, they come from a rainforest and that rain is coming down quite a lot, quite a frequent frequent amount. But there's, there, there clearly is something different because I've experienced what happens when they sit in water for too long. Now, maybe it's because the rainwater is, is fresh and it's constantly moving, whereas when it, they're sitting in that water, it isn't. And there's no ventilation around that 
I don't know, but for whatever the reason, they don't like to sit in water. And even my Dendrobium noblis star class over here that doesn't actually have any gravel underneath, you can see, but it's in a black pot which is raised up and there's a hole in that black pot so I know that the water will drain through. So you don't want your orchids to be sitting in water in a country like this. So that's number three. Uh, number four of things I wish I'd known a year ago. Um, I've already mentioned the fact that orchids are roughly split into three different groups, cool, intermediate and warm. And that if you have uh, something that's classed as a warm orchid, or even like the higher end of the intermediate, then you're going to have to do what I've done and create this warm area so that you've got it completely partitioned off so that you can keep them at a minimum of about 18 degrees Celsius. Now, the issue with that is that I'm having to, even in the middle of July now, which is our warmest month, July and August, warmest couple of months, even now I'm having to heat this side of the greenhouse. Like for example, last night it was down to about 12 degrees Celsius. So that heater down there was having to come on to kick it back up to 18 degrees Celsius. Now imagine if I hadn't have bought any warm growing orchids and I'd have only had those that didn't mind going down to 12 degrees, then what would have meant for me was I would probably finishing my heating of the greenhouse around May time and might not even start it till late September early October whereas having the warm end of the greenhouse now I even though it means I can grow a wider range of plants it is a lot more expensive because I am constantly having to heat it up especially at night even during the day at some times at some points of the month in this country it's all about the Gulf Stream and when the Gulf Stream goes too high up then we get pretty warm steady uh, settled weather when the Gulf Stream goes too low down as it's doing at the moment then it's constant rain and wind and pretty cold and once it goes from one to the other it tends to stay there for a number of months it doesn't kind of flip and flop uh, on, a, on a daily basis so yeah that's definitely something I wish I'd known and now that I do know maybe it's too late I don't know but perhaps in future as things move on I might open it back up and just have cool to intermediate orchids growing in here um, and that will definitely save me on costs but we'll see as long as I can afford it I think I might carry on for a little bit longer and number five of things I wish I'd known a year ago so here's a view you don't normally get from about two feet high looking upwards <laughs> but actually we're going to look downwards because this is all about heating costs so if you're in a similar situation to me you're, you're in a, a temperate zone and you have to heat up your grow space or greenhouse obviously if you have a grow space or a conservatory then it's going to be much much cheaper for you compared to me because the only installation i've got as you can see is bubble wrap and i've left most of the bubble wrap on because it wouldn't involve me taking all these plants out if i wanted to change it and i know i will have to at some point but hopefully that's in a number of years time so uh, I did do a video on this a number of months ago where I showed you how I calculate costs and the gadgets I'll just point to them over there. there's a little gadget there and there's another one there which are attached to my heaters and what they do is they tell me exactly how much it's cost me on a day-to-day -day basis to heat overnight now obviously it's certain months of the year they're even heating it during the day so Lots and lots of figures there, and what I've done here, just to simplify it a bit, I have broken down, or added up, if you like, <laughs> the exact amounts that it's cost me through the year so far. Now, a few things to mention, I only did a couple of months in August there where I heated it, because obviously August, at that point I didn't have the cold side and the warm side everything was in the whole greenhouse it was just one big space so i was only keeping it to about 12 degrees so september august september you wouldn't expect it to be to be on the heaters to be on for a, a long time and of course it wasn't six pound 93 it cost me 
October beginning to get a bit colder still no warm side set up at that point £25.75 November still no warm side £57 you can see it's getting more expensive December which turned out to be my more expensive month and I'm wondering whether uh, even though I didn't have the warm side in December whether I had my temperatures a little bit higher I might have had it at 15 16 I forget but it cost me £106.82 January getting into winter now £92.90 I built the warmer side round about January February £97.96 March £77.26 I'm sure you can read them yourself and then get down to June July so far I'm still paying so all of June and what are we now 10th of July as I film this it's cost me £44.95 so I'm still paying for the warmer side when you average that out I know this is a very rough calculation because it isn't 12 months it isn't even 10 months it's kind of a you know rough roughly 10 months averages at about £61 per month now that can change on a year-to-year -year basis because we can very definitely get colder winters and milder winters I remember a few years ago we had a winter where it snowed like for months on end and we had temperatures down to minus 8 minus 10 in this area and there are winters where we don't get anything like that you know where it very very rarely goes frosty over winter so I would say last winter was an average-ish winter from the winters that I recall so at the moment it's costing me about £61 a month so that's something that I wish I'd known um, I'm not sure I would have done it any differently but it's certainly something to bear in mind for the future so that's the costs but coming up in a little while we have the most common of my greenhouse pests so don't go anywhere so number six of things that I wish I'd known a year ago and it's kind of along the same lines as the watering the over watering and I did it with this one and I potted this one up and I put it in far too big a pot so that's a little tip for people who are quite new to orchid growing and are struggling to keep from over watering them make sure it's in a small pot why well because if you have a bigger pot it's not the case like it is with temperate plants that they will expand to fill that pot and give you a nicer plant what will happen is you'll have lots of media around the roots which will not dry out so again it leads to rotting of the root so if you can keep it in as small a pot as possible and just as i pan around here that happened to this cattleya i over potted it all the roots died off and then i put it in here and now it looks like it's really tightly in that pot but it's fine uh, as soon as i get some new growths on there i will repot that and give it a slightly bigger pot but better to be in a smaller pot in a temperate climate than to be in a larger one this miltoniopsis looks like it's in a really big pot but it has lots of excellent roots and i've moved it over to one side of the pot just to give it room to grow some new pseudo bulbs over here um, I might turn out that that's too big a pot but because I'm more experienced at it now I know when to water this and I double check triple check that it's ready to be watered before I water it so as you can see we might have some condensation around there but we don't have lots and lots of wet media and that's what you're trying to avoid so number six of things that I wish I'd known is to make sure that I put my orchids in as small a pot as I can get them in and number seven of things I wish I'd known is to put your orchids in media that is suitable for the climate that you're in. Now this one, I haven't done anything with it. I'm just feeling now, I've not watered that for two weeks and it's soaking wet. So I know that that really is going to need to be changed into a different media. Uh, looking at it, the blooms are probably going to last a few months yet because these are long flowering plants but it doesn't want to be in all this soft soggy moisture retentive moss unless of course you can be very very disciplined and know when to water it now i can be disciplined but because it's not in a transparent pot which is another of the things i wish i'd known because it's in uh, an opaque pot then that's no good for me because it's difficult to tell whether that media is really wet 
or dry and you can probably tell that I've had it out of this pot that many times to test that's how important it is and that's how seriously I take it I used to think that they were in transparent pots because they photosynthesize and I think that really is a little bit of a myth that's come from Phalaenopsis orchids because these are, are green roots people have said to me in the past well yeah that's because they like to photosynthesize and maybe they do I don't know if they do or they don't but that's not the reason that we put them in transparent pots the reason for going in transparent pots is because they're so prone to rotting at the roots if you leave them wet so you must make sure that they're in a transparent pot and then you can see what's going on so that's my next item on the list and number eight on my list of things I wish I'd known is the pests, the one you've all been waiting for. So, what pests are most frequent in my greenhouse? Well, for orchids, <laughs> we've got to separate them out here because I have different pests for different plants because I don't only have orchids in here. So for orchids, it's definitely toss, it's a bit of a toss up between spider mite and slugs. This one over here has had spider mite and if I'm not careful, it'll get it again which is something that I must make sure that I do. You've got to keep constantly checking your plants really close up. Spider mite is one that I really don't like because I can't tell. Uh, I'm short-sighted and I'm at that age now that even when I have glasses on and the bifocals, when I get right up to them, I still can't see them. I need to take, I need to take my glasses off, I need to take my contact lenses out to get close enough to see the spider mite, they're so small. So spider mite is probably number one enemy, which I'm not really keen on. Uh, I have used systemics, I've used it on this one, but I'm really, I've, I've been used systemics for the last eight, 10 months. I'm really not that thrilled with the effects that they have. They might get rid of that pest, but they cause so many mutations, uh, especially in the streptocarpus, which I know we're not talking about today, but they cause that many mutations that I really would like to try and avoid using systemics if at all possible. Somebody mentioned neem oil to use, but then again, somebody else said, if it's in a greenhouse, it will actually cook the plants rather than uh, just save them from a, a pest. So we, we would just jump into another problem there. So I'm still not sure what to do about that, but fortunately at the moment, I seem to be pest free, although I've just had some green fly on the strips, uh, but that's easily sorted. For the orchids, so far I've used systemics and so far it seems to be keeping them, those particular pests at bay. But my other pest that I get quite a lot of are slugs. Now you could go around this greenhouse and you would think that there is nowhere to get in, but they will find it. It is a greenhouse, it's not a house. There are, you know, it's not completely airtight and there are lots of vents, there are lots of windows and they get in somehow they get in so the best thing to do is to come in at night time practically as soon as you get to that point i'm not talking about dusk as soon as it gets to like a real dark just after dusk then those slugs come out so if you come out you come out into your greenhouse with a torch or well i just switch my grow lights on have a really good hunt and a good inspection you usually find them it's not the leaves in my case anyway that they tend to eat. I know they can eat the softer ones like the dendrobium ones, but they don't tend to go for that in my case. They tend to go for the roots. Like for example, this one, which this is a Lelia Anceps, which has a wonderful spike on there, just developing, and we can see that. But this one, I could see some telltale slime trails over the pseudo bulbs and the leaves. But when I looked down into the media, there was the slug right in the middle of the pot like but inside the pot so i had to well i couldn't unpot it because of those roots down there i didn't want to cause a problem with the roots that were already there so i managed to stick a pen knife down the side i mean this is really gruesome i managed to spear it uh, but this is what happened and this isn't the only one it happens to i think because orchids tend to grow in bark it's really easy for the slugs to crawl down amongst the bark and it's the roots they're after it's the soft roots they do it on cattleyas they eat the soft roots on cattleyas same thing happened with this dendrobium kingianum with the lovely new growths on it 
Uh, it also, a slug was found in here halfway down a pot. Um, the catlias, if I just take you over to the catlias, sorry for all this jiggery pokery here. Uh, this catlia here, over here, I had first couple of new roots on and blow me a slug came along and ate the tips you can see those nice green tips there that's what they're after so slugs definitely a problem so what have we had spider mite slugs just remember the third one scale insect i can't actually remember which plant it was yes i can it's come back to me it was a lelia onset again little pest this one uh, when i first got this it had some scale insect down at the bottom of the pseudo bulbs and uh, it wasn't actually me that spotted them it was actually uh, Margaret East from Emmy's Orchids that spotted them on one of my videos which was I thought was uh, pretty impressive to spot them on somebody else's video but fortunately she told me about it and I've been very vigilant ever since so if that's something that I've learned it's to make sure you pick up your plants don't just look at them pick them up and inspect them close up because that's the only way you're going to pick things up like scale insect and spider mite green fly usually pretty easy to spot because they have the the little kind of exoskeletons that they've shed and you see those all over the place uh, but i have to say green fly haven't been a problem on orchids it's mainly been slugs uh, spider mite and the scale insect and for number nine, we're back to this Oncidium Sweet Sugar, which this is the one that's called Oncidessa, isn't it? Not the Burrageria. I hope you spotted that. Um, so this one, again, is one which is a good example of something that I didn't know, which I, I'm really pleased I do know now, and it's a good characteristic of orchids, is that they can very easily rejuvenate if you have rotted all the roots. And I can probably point to half a dozen orchids in this greenhouse where I have killed off the roots and been patient with it, managed to change the conditions, change the media, change my watering habits with it and managed to get it to regrow its roots. I know it was my fault in the first place but it's a really good thing to know that if you make a mistake they are very forgiving, they want to survive so if you manage to do as I did and rot the roots of any orchid then know that they do still have a chance of survival so I did it with this one that's one let me just work my way around here two with the epidendrum and of course some of these are not my fault <laughs> for example this is Dendrobium berioda uh, this one had no roots, I potted this up rather recently but it had no roots because that's the way it arrived and if you buy your orchids from a place like I buy them from then you don't know until it arrives if you like me you tend to leave it until it's finished blooming and then when it's finished blooming you unpot it and then that's where you find the good or bad news but I'm not worried about it anymore because I know it's got loads of new growth so I know that now that I've chopped off all the dead roots that it will rejuvenate so I'm just keep looking round here so that one lost all its roots that one did um, no Zygopadalum was okay that one hasn't got any roots or it didn't have last time I looked this one, the Dendrobium tile and black, you can see there. I don't know if you remember the video I did on that where it had no roots. It's now about to bloom and it's got a new growth. So it's certainly not the case. Oh, and of course, this one, this Catlia, which had it was a massive Catlia, it had nothing, no roots whatsoever. It was just like a flat rhizome once I cut all the roots off, but you've got new growth there. Another new growth, uh, gosh they're very sticky. I'm hoping they're going to have some blooms in because they were gorgeous. This was another Catlia, this was an orange Catlia again. Tons of new roots now. So don't be afraid of cutting all the dead stuff. Some dead stuff on the, the top there. So one of the best things you can do is get to recognize which are dead and cut off the dead ones and you will get some new ones if you are patient. So that is number nine of things I wish I'd known right at the beginning. And number 10 of things I wish I'd known a year ago. So 
Number 10 is all about what satisfaction and immense enjoyment I get from coming in here. This is my little piece of tropical paradise. If you think about it, over the winter we've got in the UK probably about eight to ten, well maybe not ten months, but probably at least eight months of really dull, nasty, cold, miserable weather to come in here and to be able to see all these tropical plants. And yes, I might have problems with them. Yes, there's a, it's a steep learning curve compared to looking after the gardens I'm used to looking after, but I've enjoyed it immensely. And something else that I didn't know was how wonderful the orchid community is online. In fact, I would extend that and say anybody involved in any kind of plants. Okay, I don't have millions of subscribers. I'm not interacting with millions of people, but I'm certainly interacting with hundreds of people. And I haven't come across not one person who you would classify as a troll or somebody out to make trouble or just somebody who's downright awkward or nasty not come across one person everybody's been absolutely wonderful they've been really caring and keen and enthusiastic and willing to share with me their knowledge and the things that they know and their resources and how they do things and they've also been very very complimentary as well so it, that really that was a surprise to me i wasn't expecting that i was expecting it to be similar to other online communities that have come across i'm thinking of course of facebook and facebook it seems to be such a nasty place to be these days that i wonder why anybody's on it and i, I wonder if anybody is on it to be honest i know i'm on it but you know this is just part of promoting your channel but if it wasn't for that i don't think i'd bother instagram if you don't follow me on instagram get into the link in my description and go and follow me over there all i post is plant photos although i did post a photo of me with my haircut the other day i was so happy to finally get it done so uh yeah so that's something that i didn't know and i do now and i'm really pleased that i started this kind of journey off i know it's a cliche but uh, I'm really pleased that I started doing this and I've got plenty more to come and I'm really happy to be sharing this journey with you. So if you do buy orchids online, I'm going to show you in either a card or the end screen, I'm not sure which, a video that I made not very long ago talking about all the things that I think orchid growers and orchid sellers should do when they sell their orchids online. So that is also useful for people who buy orchids online, hopefully. So go and give that a watch. But if you enjoyed this video, please comment below. Is there anything that I've mentioned already that you can relate to? Or is there something in there that you specifically or specific to your own situation that you wish you'd known 12 months ago? I'd be really glad to hear about it and discuss it with you. And for now, that's it. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye.